G'day, mate. Forty here. I've never really paid much attention to Russell Brand as a thinker, as a pundit, as an intellectual, but now he's dominating the news because of these rape allegations. So I decided to do a little bit of a deeper dive into Russell Brand, and this is the one thing that jumps out to me about Russell Brand because it is so common with so many pundits on the right. Now, I wouldn't classify Russell Brand as, as right wing, but with, with a lot of pundits on the right, such as Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh, and Nick Fuentes, Mike Enoch, uh, particularly Eric Stryker, much of the right stuff crew, right? They just pour out an avalanche of words. It's not so much specific arguments usually that they're making. It's just pouring out an avalanche of words to try to overwhelm and mesmerize and, and take control of their audience. And I noticed that, you know, Russell Brand behaves, you know, much the same way. It's not the specific quality of what he says. It's not the words and the arguments that he makes. It's the emotional experience that he gives people. And I, I think that accounts for his influence and following. It's not the, you know, the shiny, sterling intellectual caliber of his arguments. All right, this is from Conspirituality, the podcast. And the voices of real people. The mirror world is a place that allows narcissists to co-opt the language of solidarity oligarchs to pretend they're rooting for the working class, manic comedians to pretend that they can... So you'll be shocked to learn that Conspirituality is a left-wing podcast that critiques non-normative approaches to wellness, health, uh, medicine, and the like. Teach meditation and aggressive misogynists to pretend that they are interested in empowering women. Now, Klein's formulation of the mirror world is really perfect for Brand because it allows us to consider the theater of a highly visible conspiracy theorist who has invented a countercultural truth-telling persona. Right, that's usually what it takes to become successful as a podcast host, a pundit, a live streamer, is that you put on a theatrical quality. You give across the feeling that you are imparting something very wise. I mean, Brett Weinstein and, and his wife, Heather Heyer, are very good at this. Eric Weinstein's very good at this. You feel, when you listen to them, Barack Obama's very good at this. You feel, feel like you're getting something profound. But upon examination, the profundity falls apart. Oh, no, that extemporizes on everything while investigating nothing beyond what the algorithms tell him will go viral. It allows us to consider what happens when such a person who pretends to research is actually investigated by those who do not live and will go in the mirror world. First, I should review the headlines coming to us through a harrowing channel. So why do so many successful podcasters that live stream hosts go in this particular direction? Well, they do it, optimize for audience, right? have a choice as a podcaster and a live streamer. Do you optimize for truth or do you optimize for audience, for profit, for clicks, for status? They're so confident in everything they're saying. They believe in it so strongly. They're willing to do anything. I need to become this. I think it's an unconscious thing. Humans want to be revered. All right. This is from a YouTube channel called The Rewired Soul. It's an atheist in 12-step recovery from alcoholism someone who revered Russell Brand's book and approach to recovery, but made a video about a year ago talking about how Russell Brand became the new Alex Jones. They want to be on top of the group. Let's take a look at this in the context of Russell Brand. As you can see, he was getting 100,000 views and sometimes hundreds of thousands of views, or it was as low as 60,000. Then look what happened whenever he pushed the Great Reset conspiracy theory. He got 2.6 million views pushing the Great Reset. And then after that, his video about being a vegan dropped to 173,000. After that, having a balanced discussion about the culture war only got him 60,000 views. Fast forward to the COVID vaccine rollout, and you start saying that much like Miranda, he's being rewarded for videos about the vaccine and Fauci. Not only that, but he was getting a lot of views from pro-Trump people and people who don't like CNN. Will Storr writes in the status game that there are three types of these games. The dominance game, the success game, and the virtue game. Russell Brand is playing the virtue game. Storr defines virtue games as when status is rewarded to players who are conspicuously dutiful, obedient, and moralistic. 
He writes, most of the time, we don't check for ourselves what's true. We check with our elites. We believe what we're supposed to. This even counts for the most precious of our beliefs, the ones we categorize as quote unquote moral. The moral reality we live in is a virtue game. We use our displays of morality to manufacture status. So Will Storr argues that we treat moral beliefs as though they're a moral absolute. During these extreme polarized times, these moral beliefs have completely, completely trumped science and actual evidence. Like think about how many people just have to do so many mental backflips and they experience this cognitive dissonance. All right, so a great understated reason for why so many people hold the political, cultural, religious views that they do is because that is high status, all right? We want to feel cool. We want to look cool. After we get our basic needs met, most of us are primarily striving for status. At the same time, we don't like other people who are striving for status. So obvious drivers, right, we dislike them, even though striving will, will empower much of what we do. So I just subscribed to the Patreon for the podcast, If Books Could Kill Us. A couple of lefties who are investigating airport bestsellers and from their first episode, it basically went to number one on the iTunes chart. So if you want to know how to do a successful podcast, right, you do worse than looking at uh, what uh, If Books Could Kill, what they produced. And here they are on a famous seminal essay by philosopher Harry Frankfurt on bullshit. Three times. I read it once in, I think, undergrad and then once in my 30s. And I remembered it being really good. And I was like, Peter, we should talk about something that's like good for once. We mm -hmm. should like actually dive into like some ideas. We want this to be like an ideas podcast. Yeah. And then I reread it for this and it sucks. <laughs> I was really mad. <laughs> yeah. So we both read it, uh, making this a unique episode. We're breaking the format. And that was my experience too. The central thesis is really good. Yes. And the actual essay sucks dude interminable sucks yeah this is kind of why we wanted to do this like originally we thought this was going to be like a deep dive into the book and mm -hmm. you know talk about his examples and kind of apply those to real life but in the book he doesn't really do any of that it's like super conceptual yeah. and so we are going to talk about the book a little bit but then we're mostly going to provide like our own examples of Right, this famous book, this famous essay on bullshit, it really doesn't provide any examples, except the essay itself is really an example of BS. Of like the 2023 bullshit that we are surrounded by, because he's weirdly bad at making the case for his own idea. Yeah. Like, he basically spends the first... I did it, I did it on audiobook this mm -hmm. time, so I don't know the pages, but he spends the first like hour and a half saying what it isn't yeah and then he says what it is in the last like five minutes and then he's like peace out right <laughs> he doesn't give any examples he does a thing <laughs> where you are genuinely 85 percent of the way into the essay before he lays his thesis out clearly and he tells a long story about wittgenstein which i did not Dude. like i did not see the relevance of and he talks about some fucking book he's like this other guy defined the seven kinds of lies but that's not what we're talking about <laughs> so there's the augustine <sighs> book there's the um the humbug concept that he examines <laughs> the hum the humbug okay so these uh, these co-hosts, all right, you got Michael Hobbs and Peter Shamshri, and uh, the one who sounds like a woman is the uh, the gay guy. All right, trying to remember which which one that is. I think that's Michael Hobbs. All right, so if uh, if books could kill is the name of the podcast, there's a lot of good stuff in here, even if you are not a left of which they are to some degree ignorant. Closely related instances arise from the widespread conviction that it is the responsibility of a citizen in a democracy to have opinions about everything, or at least everything that pertains to the conduct of his country's affairs. The lack of any significant connection between a person's opinions and his apprehension of reality 
will be even more severe, needless to say, for someone who believes it is his responsibility as a conscientious moral agent to evaluate events and conditions in all parts of the world. This was the part that I like really related to, where it's like, sometimes you just have to talk and you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Mm -hmm. This was like a lot of my experience in like high school and college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just like, I need to produce words on this thing that I'm really not qualified to speak about. Right. This is also a lot of, especially in our political discourse, and like, Jesus fucking Christ, how many topics have we covered on the show that perfectly encapsulates this, right? It's like someone who doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. But like, if you're reasonably intelligent and you're an okay writer, you can write around the fact that you have no clue what you're... Right. Most of what pundits produce, they really don't know what they're talking about. Most of what, you know, Russell Brand says doesn't stand up to any intellectual scrutiny. Most of what... Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh and right-wing talk show hosts produce doesn't stand up to intellectual scrutiny. We're talking about, and you right. have not spoken to any experts. Right. The amount of fucking words that we are surrounded by that are not. That is right. I mean, that just nails a, a problem as we try to make sense of the world. And it's so much easier to make sense of the world if you've got, you know, a handful of people that you can kind of rely on to make sense of the buzzing, complicated reality around us produced by someone with any actual knowledge is like really staggering to think about. Yeah, I think that's right. And that's why I think it was Thomas Friedman that made us think about this essay, because that is a man who writes an enormous amount about circumstances of which he knows very little. Yeah. You can see a certain dynamic playing out in almost all of his writings and all of like similar writings, the David Brooks writings. Right. So what's going on with Russell Brand uh, is not unique as, as far as his rhetorical avalanche style. Uh, you, you see the same thing in writing with Thomas Friedman, New York Times foreign affairs correspondent. You see it with New York Times columnist Pamela Paul, New York Times columnist David Brooks. Right. This is the dominant mode of discourse in punditry. Yeah. Where you can say a couple things that you know, speculate about a couple of things that you don't know, mm -hmm. and then imply that you have like reached a conclusion of some sort. Yeah. Right. And that I think is like a very common form of bullshit. This is the thing that kind of bugs me is I think what he's saying here is in an educated society with mass literacy, where we have roughly 35% of the population is now college graduates, you're kind of expected to have opinions and have knowledge on like a preposterously wide range of topics, right? You're supposed to know about climate change and yeah. welfare and like a huge range of issues. And of course, you're not going to be an expert on any of them. And like, yeah, some of the stuff you're just going to translate into cocktail party chatter. And like, you're just going to have one fucking fun fact about like, should we use nuclear power or not? Right. And like, that's kind of fine on a civilian level. I don't really mind the fact that most people are not super well informed about these technical issues. What does bug me though, is that there's an entire class of journalists yeah. who doesn't think it's their job to go any deeper. Mm -hmm. What you've basically done is misinformed the public because they're relying on you to do fucking work. Like, what do you think journalism is? <laughs> it's not engaging in the debate. Anyone can fucking do that. It should be trying to separate fact from fiction. Right. So when I spoken to people on this show who had passed opinions on on books, on essays, on, on papers that, that they hadn't even read. I just knew that this person was reckless and was, you know, cruising for a bruising. It, it's not a good sign if you do this. And I think the sort of central trueness of Harry Frankfurt's essay is that, like, we're surrounded by a bunch of people who just aren't interested in fucking doing that. And to a degree can't. You know, yeah. we've talked about how widespread the idea of like the general journalist is. Like the journalist who believes that their job is to know stuff about everything mm -hmm. and whose publication, generally speaking, believes that their job is to know stuff about everything. Mm -hmm. And no one can have expertise that broad. No. And if you try to, what you can do at your best as a reporter is to have some idea about, you know, who are reliable sources and in what ways are they reliable and what ways are they unreliable. You will be talking out of your ass. Yes. And so Matt Iglesias 
believes that he can weigh in on nearly anything. Yeah. And the result is that he is very consistently talking out of his ass. Yeah. And experts who actually do know stuff about the stuff that he's talking about will step in and be like, hey, you're dumb as shit, dude. You have no idea what you're talking about. Right. And then he can dig in his heels right. because he believes that he is smart enough to grasp this stuff. And the idea that other people are like, considerably more knowledgeable about something it doesn't compute in his brain well i actually am like somewhat a defender of generalists partly because i am one (laughs) and like i want to be able to defend my own career but also there are journalists that manage to do this like david wallace wells who's also a columnist at the new york times spends like a week or two digging into a topic before he writes about it right he just wrote about long covid and like he did a bunch of work he interviewed people he read the relevant literature Yeah, David Wallace Wells is an excellent example of someone who does the work. Uh, Christopher Cordwell on the right, I think, is a pretty good example of someone who does the work before he starts dispensing his opinions. And he's like, here is the consensus among experts. I actually think that that's fine. And like part of what journalists do, it's not necessarily that they're engaging in a debate or like delivering takes or whatever. It's just like they have more time than you do Mm -hmm. for me. Right. So anyone who's immediately, you know, passing off strong opinions on either side of this latest Russell Brand rape controversy, I mean, it's it's absolutely reckless. The accusations do seem pretty strong against him. Uh, on the other hand, what were these women doing them doing, placing themselves in harm's way? I mean, how often do you hear women who are a part of the the Me Too movement uh, taking responsibility for their own choices, for you know, why, despite all advice to the contrary, even people pleading with them, you know, don't, you know, go over there alone to a predator's house. They insist on doing it anyway because they just feel so compelled because the guy's just so charismatic and so powerful and they just can't help themselves. But now they want government laws against, you know, what they consented to do. In phase, it's like, I'm going to spend two weeks looking into like the history of mad cow disease. Most people don't have that kind of time. This is my job. Right. It's not that the generalist is a faulty or bad category of journalist. It's that there's a slippery slope element, right? Yeah. Where someone who doesn't really have a beat can just start spouting off, right? Yeah. Especially if they find themselves in a position of great discretion. Right. There's- All these uh, right-wing influences are just spouting off in support of Russell Brand without knowing anything about the, the truth or falsity of these accusations against him. So much of what passes for punditry and commentary is just people choosing sides and just choosing to support their side, despite uh, all all evidence to the contrary. There's no check on a lot of these folks. And I think that is the sort of dangerous side of having generally. So this uh, Russell Brand investigation, right, it's not easy to find online. You have to download it through the sharing sites. But it was the work of years, all right? They didn't just concoct this in a couple of weeks because they didn't like Russell Brand's, you know, anti-COVID vaccine stance, all right? They had one woman who was working on this for, for four years. She spoke to dozens of people. You had a whole team of investigative reporters producing something that is pretty sharp and convincing. This journalist, yeah. if you're not staying on the grind, then you will eventually become a David Brooks. Well, speaking of which, should we do our examples? Yeah. So after we read this book and we realized that it wasn't as like meaty as it could have been, we thought that since the book itself does not provide very many examples of the concept, we thought... Okay, talking here about the book on uh, bullshit. All right, so here's a summary of the accusations against Russell Brand for Dispatch's documentary based on a Times and Sunday Times investigation by Rosamond Irwin, Charlotte Wace, and Paul Morgan Bentley. Irwin was on the story. So it is a good sign for the integrity of investigation if it is multiple organizations teaming up because it's easy to fool yourself and it's easy to fool one person. But when you have multiple organizations working together on a project, all right, whatever you end up publishing, it has to pass muster with all of these organizations, right? All of these organizations are effectively putting their head on the chopping block to publish something controversial. For four years, and her colleagues signed on about three years in, and their investigation platforms the stories of numerous women who variously allege that Brand raped, sexually assaulted, or sexually abused them. 
And the stories are uncanny in their similarity. The women describe Bran's very direct and intentional targeting, periods of boundary testing, and how, at the peak of the alleged aggression, his eyes would go black and unresponsive. I know from days of my social life that I could go to a party and I would just tune in to the, to the one woman who I just sense would not be a lot of effort to get into bed. So I, I think many, many men in particular who've led promiscuous lives, they, they kind of have this sixth sense for the female weakness. In the Dispatches documentary, the broader context for these incidents is filled in by a former personal assistant and other sources. Why do multiple organizations team up against a podcaster? Because Russell Brand is much more than a podcaster, particularly in England. All right. He worked with the BBC for years, uh, producing documentaries, producing radio shows. He's been a star in major motion pictures, right? He's been on the telly for more than two decades in Great Britain. So he's not just a podcast bro. Who described Brand's daily schedule being dictated by his insatiable predation. Now, I, I think Russell Brand would admit to this. He admits to being a sex addict and at, at various sex addiction programs that I've gone to, 12-step programs, you find various celebrities, often ones who've gotten in trouble in the, the Me Too movement for their out-of-control sexual predation. Runners and production staff were enlisted to provide Brand with an endless supply of new sexual partners recruited on the fly from studio audiences. The story that has received the most attention so far comes from a woman speaking under the pseudonym of Alice, who alleged... Yeah, Russell Brand is the one who did a hit piece on Mark Collette for the BBC. But remember, you know, Mark Collette uh, conspired in his own destruction. He, you know, willingly offered himself up as a sacrifice. Just that Brand grievously assaulted her during their three-month relationship 18 years ago when he was 30 and she was 16. Yeah, but she <laughs> carried on in this relationship for, for three months, right? She chose him, right? The, the taxi driver who drove her to Russell Brand's home, pled with her not to go in, but she knew better. She described how a car hired by the BBC, where Brand was working at the time, came to pick her up from high school and deliver her to Brand's flat. The journalists discovered that Brand's management at the time took measures to keep the relationship secret. In the UK, where this took place, Alice had technically attained the age of consent under a law passed in 1885. And in follow-up interviews, Alice has stated that she hopes her story helps to change that law. Okay, technically, well, technically, as in if you drive 34 miles an hour in a 35-mile-per-hour zone, you're abiding by the speed limit. All right, Russell Brand was abiding by the speed limit here. All right, it's, it's no more technical than anyone else uh, obeying the law. Now, what, what kills me is these women seem to take their responsibility for their own choices they want government to change laws to restrict their choices and other people's choices because they don't have the capability of moral agency. They are not capable of taking responsibility for their own choices. They are not capable of making adult decisions on their own. They are essentially saying, I, I am a child. Allow the government to serve as a guardian for me. The story of Nadia, another pseudonym, is also crucial because she was able to provide the medical report from her visit to a rape crisis center shortly after Brand allegedly raped her. And she was able to provide a string of text messages dated within hours of the incident between her number and a number confirmed to be Brand's. In that thread, Brand apologized profusely for harming her in response to her clear description of an attack. The Metropolitan Police in London have said they have opened an investigation into so the greater context is that all sex contains an element of violence, right? It, it is not a particularly loving act in general, particularly when it is sporting sex, all right? This is not sex in the context of marriage, right? Not many people are hurt in the context, I would assume, of, of marital sex. But from someone who enjoyed a great deal of you know, recreational and sporting sex, uh, people tend to be a lot more adventurous, pushing boundaries, and, you know, experimenting and, you know, treating the whole thing in a more sporting manner than you would find in the context of a long-term relationship. And so, yeah, people are more likely to get hurt in that particular context. You choose to play tackle football, you're much more likely to get hurt than if you perform on the drama team, all right? You step onto the playing field to play tackle football, all right? There's a very high likelihood you'll get hurt. If you step into the playing field of recreational sex, 
outside of the context of a long-term relationship, you're very likely to get hurt. The allegations against Brand. And what has Brand himself said? The Times notes that they gave him eight days to respond to their reporting. The day before the story... And Elliot Blatt says if Luke's live stream became popular because his different people have different gifts views, he would be investigated and declared to be a monster. I have been investigated many times. And uh, yeah, maybe not quite a monster, but many of the portrayals were not positive. Dropped. Brand issued a preemptive denial of all of the allegations. Here's a minute of that, that's all you need, of his last-ditch effort to dodge this train. These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies. And as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent. And I'm being transparent about it now as well. And to see that transparency metastasized into something criminal that I absolutely deny makes me question, is there another agenda at play? particularly when we've seen coordinated media attacks before, like with Joe Rogan, when he dared to take a medicine that the mainstream media didn't approve of. And we saw a spate of headlines from media outlets across the world using the same... Okay, the reason that Joe Rogan gets attacked is not because he took a medicine that the media did not approve of. The reason that Joe Rogan gets attacked is because he promotes all sorts of you know, wacky, uh, possibly dangerous at times, uh, ill-informed... Uh, points of view uh, that he has guests on uh, and he doesn't have the intelligence or the background to ask them the important questions, right? Joe Rogan is the intellectual equivalent of Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop website, all right? It's, he's not very smart. He has no ability to distinguish, you know, what's right from what's false. And he is just easily seduced, right? Every bit is easily seduced as, uh, say, the women in this Russell Brand investigation. Language. I'm aware that you guys have been saying in the comments for a while, watch out, Russell, they're coming for you, you're getting too close to the truth. Russell Brand did not kill himself. So you get the gist. Now, this video was instantly endorsed, or boosted by, among many others, Elon Musk, Tucker Carlson, Andrew Tate, Jordan Peterson, Ian Miles Chong, and Canadian self-help and women's empowerment guru, Danielle Laporte, who shared the video to Instagram with the caption, steadfast, unwavering compassion to you. Now, I should note that... Fr Why did multiple organizations team up to investigate Monk misconduct he's already confessed to? Because he didn't confess to raping women, right? He confessed to promiscuity. And society has a very different attitude towards promiscuity than it does towards rape. Friend of the pod, Dr. Lisa Rankin, who also has a large following in the alternative. Do I consider traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, herbs, wacky? I used it myself. I found it uh, pretty effective for some of the ailments that uh, I was using it for. So, so I'd have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. So I'll give you an example. I went to Kaiser for some elbow pain or hip pain that, that I was having. And I remember I got an affirmative action doctor who's not very competent and was like just made my pain worse by the the careless way that they you know moved me around and declared oh you'll probably need to have a hip replacement in you know five or ten years uh then i went to a practitioner of acupuncture and the elbow pain that had afflicted me for about a year was just cured in about four sessions so for many things traditional chinese medicine is highly effective then when the elbow pain came back i went to a physical therapist who was great and he cured my elbow pain in one session. He was even more effective than the acupuncturist. But uh, any physical therapist who is worth his salt will not take your health insurance, will not work on a lean basis. All right. So you have to pay more money for someone who's competent. But a great physical therapist will usually be more effective at curing, you know, various aches and pains than someone practicing traditional Chinese medicine medicine world clapped back at Laporte and others by name, asking, why are spiritual white women reflexively defending an accused predator? And that's a question I think will be with us for a long time. Now, there were more intellectual or... So why do affluent white women protect an accused predator? I mean, why do we do anything? Because we see it as in our interest, because it is considered cool by the people whose opinions are most important to us.
It's not that complicated. Or maybe pseudo-intellectual defenses. Psychedelics author Daniel Pinchbeck published a Substack article in which he largely ignored the published allegations in favor of using the theories of René Girard to argue that Brand had become a ritual scapegoat for a conflicted and hypocritical culture. All of the cruder endorsements alluded to the deep state having no choice but to silence Brand's dangerous views. He was over the target, as they say in QAnon, and the elites had no choice but to pull the Me Too lever. They all suggested that the timing of the article was suspicious. Why now, they asked, just as Brand is questioning vaccines and support of Ukraine? And nowhere do these pundits indicate any understanding that it can take four years to nail down adequate sourcing and corroboration for an extremely important story, which could have fallen apart and been killed by the editorial or legal departments at any moment. On the other side of the aisle, critics of Brand have made a lot of his preemption video and its endorsements, saying that his immediate appeal to the specter of a conspiracy against him indicates that he knows what his audience expects or can be led to believe, and that he knows who his friends are. But some of this commentary strayed further into blue pill territory to settle on an appealing but I think flawed idea that Brand's most recent pivot during the COVID era into rightward-leaning conspiracy theory land was a strategic move designed to raise a digital army that would defend him against anything. He knew it was coming, they say, and he plotted out his path to exoneration years in advance. This is really implausible to me, given everything we know about online opportunism and the speed of audience capture. I think it's also implausible, given how short-term Brand's planning seems to be, and how much he clearly depends on in-the-moment improvisation and a kind of vaudeville porno style of physical theater. I understand why folks would want a mastermind-type story. The attraction is that it sidesteps the scarier problem that our media instruments are basically set up to magnify people like Brand, and that's not a mustache-twirling villain problem, that's a social architecture problem. Now, Naomi Klein offered the non-conspiratorial, non-paranoid version of this idea by tweeting out the following. Of course, Russell Brand's followers deny the allegations. He has groomed an audience to deny, disbelieve everything they see and hear, which is very different from healthy skepticism. This knee-jerk denial... Look, do you believe that Russell Brand would have been investigated so vigorously if he espoused more mainstream opinions? Yes, because obviously almost all the big names in the Me Too movement were on the left. Harvey Weinstein, Charlie Rose, etc. And they were all investigated vigorously and their careers were destroyed. So I don't believe that Russell Brand's opinions had uh, that much to do with him, him being investigated. His popularity, which you can link to his opinions, but plenty of people on, on the left, right, have been investigated and exposed, right? How is my Rosh Hashanah? It was blessed. All the women making the accusations are anonymous. I believe so. All right, let's get back to conspirituality. Conspiracy is precisely why people with plenty of skeletons in the closet love conspiracy culture. They have a built-in defense against accountability. It's all a conspiracy, always. I appreciate that Klein uses the term groomed here in a way that merges the meanings of sexual and epistemological violence, but she doesn't directly connect the two by speculating on Brand's intentionality. Now, if Brand did have some big plan in the cooker, it's not working out so far. He hasn't shown his face online since the story dropped. His management company has cut ties with him. He's canceled an entire comedy tour in the UK. YouTube has demonetized his channel, and the UK Minister for Culture, Media and Sport has sent a kind of strange, maybe ill-advised letter to the CEO of Rumble, inquiring as to whether the video platform has allowed Brand to monetize his preemptive strike against the investigation. So now apparently many brands are removing their advertising from Rumble. Now, before I... Because they haven't demonetized Russell Brand, just based on accusations. Now, these accusations do sound incredible. They do sound credible. They do sound very solid. Move on to the background and context I mentioned. There is one other preemptive move that Brand made against this story, and he posted it on TikTok two days before his blanket denial uploaded to YouTube. Christ's final words. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. Of course, in this moment, Christ is referring to his own execution at the hands of the Roman judiciary and 
Pilate famously washing his hands of our Lord and Saviour. But its relevance in that moment is very particular. Of course, the sacrifice of a living God is a massive, seismic, epochal and defining human event. But is it not more relevant right now? Because as Joseph Campbell says, what does it matter if Christ dies on the cross 2000 years ago, if we are not continually dying and reborn unto ourselves that we may experience each moment anew? Is this not exactly what Lord Buddha is referring to? Remain awake, remain in the present. Perhaps what... Yes, this was my first coffee. You're watching the 1995 movie I made that never sold Apricot Sky. And it was right here at Venice Beach on this shoot that I had my first coffee, right? Probably my, my first hit of caffeine. It was uh, 1995. And, and, and now I, I've fallen into the devil's grip. I am now drinking coffee probably three times a week. In fact, I, I had one at three o'clock this morning. I'm proud I was able to sleep in until 2.30 this morning. Then about 3, 3.30, I had my, my cup of coffee. I've been assembling my greatest blog posts from the, what, I've, I've gone back to 2012 right now. And it's, it's interesting. Like back in the day, 2012, 2013, 2014, sometimes I could produce like four thoughtful blog posts a day. But there is this tremendous heavy depression that kind of underlays you know, almost all of my blogging in from about late 2007 until the fall of 2015. So you don't detect depression in my blog posts after about the fall of 2015, only perhaps intermittently when I'm really frustrated about something, but overall, very little depression. So in... What was it? It's something like uh, June of, of 2013, I began taking modafinil. And I began using the Fisher-Wallace device around the same time. And those two in combination uh, significantly reduced my depression. Then as I was taking modafinil, I went through all the archives of Steve Saylor's website. And that launched me on my different groups have obviously different gifts kick which i've been on pretty solidly since 2014 that got me intellectually engaged so 2012 2013 i'm primarily writing about myself i'm listening to my favorite pop songs from the 1970s and 80s and just writing out you know my memories and my feelings and then i get on a daffodil and i get on a much more intellectual kick so let's go back here to the conspirituality podcast is meant or one interpretation that i might offer you of Christ's words, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do, is that most people, most of the time, are unconscious. Forgive them, they know not what they do. They don't know why they're saying that. They don't know why they're doing that. They don't know why they're driving that way. They don't know why they're treating the planet that way. They don't know why they're talking about one another in that way. Isn't it our duty to, like Christ, awaken from the flesh body and into the transcendent being of light, the elevated, escalating, transcending individual? Let me know in the comments if you agree with this interpretation that what we truly must become is conscious in this moment. Now. Okay, so with these two clips on board, I can get into the first core theme that we here on the podcast have focused on in previous coverage. And that's that Brand is a consummate bullshitter. And I mean that in the sense put forward by American philosopher Harry Frankfurt. On any given subject, Brand might be lying, Brand might not be lying. You can't really tell, and it doesn't really matter because he doesn't seem to care. He's not working his jaws in relation to any respect for what is true or useful. He speaks to seize attention, create an impression, and weave a spell. Here's what Frankfurt says about the difference between lies, truth, and bullshit. Quote, Someone who lies and someone who tells the truth are playing on opposite sides, so to speak, in the same game. Each responds to the facts as he understands them, although the response of the one is guided by the authority of the truth, while the response of the other defies that authority and refuses to meet its demands. The bullshitter ignores these demands altogether. He does not reject the authority of the truth, as the liar does, and oppose himself to it. He pays no attention to it at all. By virtue of this, bullshit is a greater enemy of the truth than lies are. Now, in his ninth hour YouTube preemptive defense, we hear one valence of Brand's bullshit, the gish gallop patter of urgent pivots, illusions, vagaries, and non sequiturs. This is Brand's manic mode. It's pressurized and claustrophobic, a wall of words that can feel physically overpowering. In the show notes, I'm going to link to my colleague Derek's close reading of one such Brand scenario 
in which he pretends to debate journalist John Heilman on The Bill Maher Show. The topic is the Dominion lawsuit against Fox News for knowingly implicating their company in electoral fraud and whether CNBC and other centrist platforms have ever been found to be likewise lying about what they know to be true. Brand is claiming that all media institutions are equally corrupt and untrustworthy, but he cannot substantiate his point with any examples when Heileman asks for the receipts. And Derek emphasizes how, in the absence of having evidence, Brand gets physically aggressive, manspreading, leaning in, making intrusive eye contact, constant touching, and never shutting up. And then if you roll the tape back to his earlier television and radio work on shows like How is Russell Brand different from Jonathan Greenblatt? Jonathan Greenblatt, for all his faults, does choose his words much more carefully than Russell Brand. Jonathan Greenblatt takes care to construct particular arguments, while Russell Brand is just just all over the map rhetorically. Like Big Brother, all of that boundarylessness of speech and body is there. That's his brand, so to speak. In prior episodes, we've also talked about the neurotic speech that so many of the male influencers we cover seemed to get locked into through a process of self-entrancement. This is true. This is a great point, right? It's coming from a lefty, but I think he's 100% correct here. In their different ways, Russell Brand, Alex Jones, Jordan Peterson, Tim Poole, Matt Walsh, Andrew Tate, Ben Shapiro, they all have it. These are all men who cannot bear to pause, let alone be interrupted. And given the nature of digital space, they never have to stop. They throw off this sense that if they closed their fire hoses, that their fragile selves would burn to the ground. Now, in brand, this improvisational tick can ascend into something that sounds like spiritual ecstasy. But the thing about the fire hose of charismatic speech is that it can't just be water or sounds. It really does have to be made up of words and phrases and ideas. But the quantity is so high that the quality and coherence cannot possibly keep up. So that brings me to the second main observation we've made about Brand and everyone who works this particular kind of shtick, that the content is never the point. Sometimes it's compelling, as when Brand goes on an anti-corporatist. Okay, Elliot Blatt says, once a man uses the phrase, phrase man spreading, he's dead to me, or man explaining. Elliot, you, uh, you like to <laughs> declare much of humanity dead to you, All right? The complexity, the multiplicity, the vulnerability of life, I think, annoys you. And so you want to boil down you know, all the variables and, and try to reduce them to some you know, manageable size. So if I simply you know, stop uh, interacting in a meaningful way with people who use you know, various phrases, then, then I'll feel more secure about my, my place in the world. I'll be less vulnerable. I, I won't have to deal with as much BS. And so I think we all have this same desire to try to economize. And so whenever we get you know, certain signals, such as people who use manspreading or mansplaining or you know, anything else that we take particular offense to, we just dismiss their humanity. We just dismiss them from our lives. We just dismiss the, the opportunity for you know, genuine conversation with them because that feels like it reduces our vulnerability to life. All right? We have to engage with fewer people. All right? We can you know, calm down, we can economize, we can direct our, our efforts more efficiently. I, I know I do this too. Rant. Sometimes it's revealing, as in the endless, partially told stories and allusions to his own behavior, but it will never stay on the same topic. Now, the principle of the content is never the point is also something we've tracked in relation to our work on cults, where a leader's point of view is nearly always impossible to clearly define. If it changes, if he reverses himself, if he jumps the shark altogether, it makes little difference because what he's really doing is holding attention through affect and behavior modification and relational manipulation, not through ideas. Why do you suppose people are so confused about Brand's politics? Is he black-pilled and apathetic as he sits with Pac-Man admitting that he never votes? Is he an anarchist trying to push Ed Miliband further to the left? Is he a Trump apologist? What exactly does he believe about vaccines? Did he really cut a whole video about the trucker convoy in Ottawa being all about some kind of peaceful protest of the authoritarianism of public health? People are confused about Brandt because none of his ideas are coherent. And that's because the content is not the point. That's a great point with all sorts of people. And I 
primarily listen to people on the right. And so I'm thinking of Ben Shapiro, uh, Matt Walsh, Dennis Prager, Jordan Peterson. The content is not the point. The ideas is not the point. It is this emotional entrancement, this emotional trance that they want to cast over an audience. That's the point. And the words are just to communicate a feeling, right? To create an emotional state, particularly a, a state of aggrievement, right? Almost all punditry, right? Almost all successful live streamers depend upon tapping into the same thing that marketers tap into. And that is that your problems are due to people outside of you. Your problems are due to an outgroup, whether it's the, the liberals, the Democrats, the, the Jews, the, the capitalists, right? You know, the problem that you have, the reason that you're a victim, why your life sucks, has nothing to do with you and your poor choices. All right, I can show you who to blame. Right? That's the path for successful right-wing live streaming and uh, punditry and for, for much of politics. All right? This is Fred Luskin. That's where religious coping can be invaluable. And where they found that so strongly was with the Amish people who, what, a decade or more ago, that guy came in and shot up all these young kids. And they offered forgiveness to uh, that person um, was because their religion so believed in forgiveness that their, their stories were about forgiveness, their heroes were people who had forgiven, and their families instructed them in direct forgiveness. So they had this pre-laid schema for how to do it. Most of us live in cultures. Right. So if you're filled with, you know, anger and resentment, you don't have to look at your own role in creating misery. Right. You don't have to look at your own choices, your own maladaptive responses to stimuli. Well, that's not true. Where we have pre-laid schemas for taking offense. For fighting people who don't do what we want. Right. I mean, is, is that true? Most people have these pre-laid schemas that they're not even conscious of for taking offense, for writing people up for, for, for tickets, essentially, in their mind because other people have broken their unenforceable rules. And for holding on to our grievances like that. Those are the cultural imprints that most of us are surrounded by. And that makes forgiveness way more difficult. Um, I have run... God, since the mid 90s, something called the Stanford University Forgiveness Project. And we have gone to many parts of the world and taught people how to forgive, even from really difficult things. Like, you know, we, we did work in Northern Ireland where we taught Catholics and Protestants who had family members killed in their violence to forgive. And we've gone to Right. And this would apply to many women as well. Dennis Prager's current wife, wife number three, relays that when she was a waitress, her, her manager grabbed her breasts and she simply removed the guy's hands from her breasts, told him not to do it anymore and just went on with her life. Now, she could have carried on her life with the self-identity as a victim of sexual violence. And many women do. Right. For incidents as trivial as that. Right? They go through life then with a chip on their shoulder that they've been a victim of sexual violence and they are afraid of men, they hate men, they just carry this, this resentment and hatred with them, plotting for revenge all their life over something relatively trivial that many other women who endured the exact same thing would uh, shrug it off and get on with it. Um, we went to the United Nations after the attack on the World Trade Center and taught people how to forgive and have gone to Sierra Leone and Colombia after their violence and stuff and taught people to forgive as well as all the normal stuff. Like, you know, grandma didn't do something or you screwed up. And we found that um, the very, the basics of forgiveness are generally the same. So I think I've, I've generally taken a stoic attitude in life, I've I've never made a report to HR in my life, right? I've never made a criminal complaint in my life. You know, I either deal with a situation or I remove myself from a situation. Even though the intensity of offense can be different, the pathway to forgiveness is not that different. 
but the intensity leads to different issues requiring more effort or more time to involve forgiveness. So my work is, um, I've written a couple very successful books on forgiveness. Um, I do coaching for people who need help with forgiveness, you know, like on Zoom. But most of my work is giving talks to remind people that if you forgive yourself or others, you will be a happier and healthier person. I, at that level, it's not complicated. If you let go of grievances and grudges, you will on the whole be a happier and healthier human being, physically healthier. Grievances are one of our, like one of humans' main mechanism for limiting our happiness. Right, I know women who filed sexual harassment lawsuits and lost, and it's just destroyed them, right? It's consumed their life for years and years and years, and it ends up with them losing their job, you know, losing their looks, losing their happiness, losing their dignity. Because often when you, you know, file a tort lawsuit where you say, hey, you harmed me, you then become obsessed with the harm that other people did to you, and that almost never has a good effect on you. You just become thoroughly incentivized to try to build as strong a case as possible about how other parties have harmed you. And sometimes it's absolutely legitimate. It's the best choice to make. But many times, probably most times, it has a bad effect on, on the people launching such lawsuits. Like we use our grudges and grievances as reasons not to be happy in this life. And you see it socially. Right. You see that with so many of my viewers and people who comment on my videos that you know, they feel like they're living under communist tyranny. And for whatever problems the United States, Canada, Australia, England have right now, if you live in one of these countries, you still have it better than 95% plus of humanity. You, you live in safer, more prosperous conditions than uh, most people on earth. You have you know, many opportunities to make something good of your life. You have freedom of worship. You can go out, you know, get a job, build a family. But people are strongly incentivized somehow. They've got this schema in their head that they are victims living under communist tyranny. Now, why is it that we are so optimized for grievance, right? Because we're optimized for survival. And having a grievance probably helps with your survival. It helps you to pass down your genes. But we are not optimized for happiness. So being optimized for survival, for passing down your genes but through the evolutionary process, is not the same as being optimized for happiness all over the place. My group was badly treated. My parents were badly treated. I was badly treated. Therefore, I'm not going to walk outside, open my arms to the sun and say how unbelievably lucky I am to spend this modest amount of time on this beautiful planet. We use our grievances as eclipses. Right. So many of the women with complaints about Russell Brand Right, they could instead introspect and think about what role did I play in putting myself in this dangerous, unhealthy situation? How much advice did I ignore? If I didn't get any advice to ignore predators like Russell Brand, how come I was in such a vulnerable position that I wasn't sharing what was going on with my life or I developed a life where nobody cared about me? So they may be 100% factually true in things that they say, and yet it may not be in their best interest to allow this resentment against Russell Brand to consume them. On the other hand, it may be in their best interest, and maybe they have not allowed their resentment against Russell Brand to consume them, and maybe they've gone on to lead happy, productive lives. So some women can, I think, uh, testify fairly and accurately about male sexual predators and not allow this to take over their life, right? Can go on to, you know, an honorable and good and thriving life, and other women just become absolutely consumed and would probably have been better off with trying to just learn a lesson from it, just trying to squeeze all the meaning that they could from these interactions to learn where they went wrong and then go on with their lives rather than trying to mount a case against people like Russell Brand. That, that's how we use them. We put them between us and the sun. And then we say the sun doesn't exist. We all do this, no matter big or small, you know, whatever group you belong to, we all do this. We all say at some level, I can't be really happy now. I can't, I can't embrace this delicious opportunity to be here for a modest period of time. 
because of X, Y, and Z. Because this person didn't do right, because I screwed up, because my group was treated. I mean, do you, do you think men are really happy, you know, having so much testosterone that they feel this imperious urge to try to have, you know, as many sexual interactions as, as possible? Right. This this sucks for men. In many ways, I'm much happier now as a 57 year old man. I don't have the same imperious sex urges that I did at 17, 27 or 37. Did unfairly. We all use that as some kind of an excuse to not open to now. To not just recognize. People are so invested in not being open to the now, to not being open to the possibilities and pleasures and rewards of the world around them to try to ward off pain, try to reduce possible discomfort, hurt, disappointment. People have these schemas to ward themselves off from reality, to ward themselves off from the opportunities and pleasures and possibilities of right now. They are so invested in their victimhood schema. So that now, and we don't know how many more nows we're gonna have. It's a gift and it's a precious gift. And on planet Earth, that gift involves suffering as well as beauty, but it's a gift. And many of us use our like grudges and grievances even worse than that. We use it to harm other people. We say to our partners or lovers, you didn't do this, therefore I'm- Right, so many people just you know carry on this chip on their shoulder after disappointment in dating. Dating seems to be the, the one dominant activity in life that I, I can think of where people become you know, less good at it the more they do of it. Like normally the more you do something, the better you get. But it seems like the more people date, the more of a shell they develop, the more of a sense of victimhood they develop, right? The more hard and cynical they get. And I mean, that's, that's true for me. I naturally tend to carry a hard cynical shell with me into the world and it kind of keeps people at, at bay keeps people at distance right as opposed to when i can be vulnerable and to you know open myself up to loving and being loved by people caring about people uh, open myself up to being you no know, hurt uh, open myself up to feeling empathy uh, much of my life, I've been afraid to feel empathy because I just get flooded by, by so much empathy that I find it disabling and I lose any sense of myself. But as I grow older, I can maintain a sense of myself and what I stand for and also have an appropriate empathy for other people and where appropriate, where safe to, to let down my you know hard, cynical exterior to allow other people to get closer to me. I'm going to treat you badly right now. And we feel perfectly justified doing that. You were bad then, I'm going to be bad now, we're even. We, we actually make believe that our grievances give us an excuse to not do the right thing. I mean, and this is true for many of the people in the, in the Me Too movement. It's an opportunity to live a life of grievance. And I think some of the, the women who came forward were absolutely heroic, but others just jumped on the bandwagon to you know, live out the possibilities of a life of grievance and revenge. So not only does unforgiveness make us less happy, but it makes us less happy producing around us. So let's say your manager or your, your rabbi or you know, your boss you know, reached out and fondled your breast when you were 17. Right? You can live as a victim of sexual violence and you know, carry that chip on your shoulder and drop out of school because you're so traumatized. Or you can shrug it off, you know, set boundaries, say, hey, that's not okay and uh, get on and create a good life. And it's really sad. It, it's, it's very sad. And so I understand why at the heart of all the wisdom traditions of this world is forgiveness, is let it go, is let it go, do the best you can, be here, you know, be here now as best you can. And if you've harmed people, ask for absolution. It's the obstacle to kindness that we all struggle with. You know, you know, when the Dalai Lama. I remember in, in therapy, my, my therapist would often say, hey, if you're more like you are right now with me, if you're more, you know, open and vulnerable and sensitive and, and soft, I think 
you know, a lot more people would feel comfortable getting close to you. But it's your hard, cynical, cold exterior that keeps people at bay. Right, back to Con Spirituality podcast on Russell Brand. The fickleness is a winning strategy for the chaos of the COVID era conspiracism that we've covered. One week, 5G tech will control your glands, then vaccines will be microchip carriers, then it's all about depopulation, then saving the children, and then the evil trans agenda, and finally, Jewish space lasers. The content doesn't matter. But it's actually more than that. Brand's ideological instability works in his favor because it pushes the relational dynamic more squarely into the spotlight. There's nothing there but him. On the podcast, we've also noted that one aspect of this transitory attitude to content shows up in the fact that cult leaders are often chronic plagiarizers. They need a steady supply of material, and they don't really care where it comes from. And if you scroll through Brand's YouTube thumbnails, it quickly becomes apparent that the topic could be literally anything, tracking increasingly rightward and paranoiac over time, while the affect, jokes, and gesticulations stay the same. And more importantly, so does the emotional urgency, the sense that everything is always on the line, the feeling that you should never not be around this intense crackle of panic and discovery. There's something really elegant and just about Brand's relationship to truth and reality being exposed by a disciplined journalism that does the exact opposite. As I mentioned, Irwin worked for four years speaking to hundreds of sources, keeping everything locked down until everything was watertight and bled dry of any speculation. And if you just think of... Lynn Medley says, uh, nice mic that this guy's got. He's probably got the same mic that I do. He just has more precise settings on it. But how much data a journey like that would render... How many asides, comments, colorful details, it would be enough for a 300-page book with a thousand footnotes. But instead, Irwin and her team run their findings through a distillation process that boils down to 6,800 words and none of them wasted. And the result is a super clear, subject-centered report showing enough detail to render a crystalline picture, but not so much as to cross over the line into the salacious. All right, so not all media is stupid, all right? Not all news reports and investigations are, you know, bogus, all right? It sounds like Channel 4 and the Times of London did a pretty solid job here in their Russell Brand investigation. It is a direct, economical, almost mundane form of devastating reporting. And it's the perfect mirror image of what Russell Brand does every time he opens his mouth. Okay, so those are some notes from our archive, from our collaboration here on the podcast, and they're all about Brand's general presentation, his charisma and affect. The more concrete area of our study involves how he pivoted in the mid-2010s towards the world of wellness influencing via 12-step discourse and his fascination with kundalini yoga. That career shift followed his resignation from his Wow, that, that sounds like me. I, I blogged on the, the porn industry, wrote about it from 1995 to 2007. And then I left, uh, took up Alexander Technique, uh, took up uh, 12 step programs, and took up Kundalini Yoga. I was really into Kundalini Yoga for two years, 20, 2009 and 2010. I spent $1,000 each year from all the yoga I wanted to uh, pass to a Kundalini Yoga Center. And I really enjoyed it. I just have a weakness for cults because when you go go to a cult, they go, yay, Luke, we celebrate you. We like you. We love you. And there's just so much love around and it just makes me feel all warm and toasty inside. But then I have a part of myself that always wants to go investigate whatever it is that I'm enthused about. And so within a month of going to Kundalini Yoga, within a month of doing thousands of dollars of damage to myself, trying to perform Kundalini Yoga poses, needing thousands of dollars of physical therapy to try to ameliorate the harm, I was investigating it. And yes, many of the, the poses and procedures were dangerous. And Yogi Bhajan did have a very dark side with uh, grooming and raping women and uh, participating in 3HO, Happy, Healthy, Holy, and the Kundalini Yoga movement, I think, uh, you know, helped some people, but also devastated thousands of lives. Popular BBC Radio 2 program after a disgusting series of comments about his sexual exploits. His redemption arc landed in California, where his movie career began to take off and where he became very enmeshed in the kundalini yoga scene. Right. So we were both in the 
the same scene, 2010, 2011, a lot of hot women in that scene. I mean, I got a, got a girlfriend there for a year. She was Jewish. It, I just liked it. It, it. it was just elevating. I, I even got up at 2 a.m. one morning to go to the yoga center to celebrate Yogi Bhajan's birthday. But I did draw the line at teacher training, right? That's how they make their money by getting you to sign up for teacher training, which you know usually runs like $3,000. So I never did sign up for the teacher training, even though attractive women asked me to. And uh, my, my ex-girlfriend, she did go whole hog and she became a Kundalini yoga teacher. Attending public classes, unlike most celebrity yoga students and men. And so what stopped me from going to Kundalini yoga was eventually I was going to a daily Talmud class at the same time. And the rabbi said, Mamish, you know, this particular yoga studio has got idols up. You know, a Jew cannot go there. And I thought, oh, I don't need the surus. I don't need the trouble. I'm not going to defy the rabbi. I'm just going to abandon this type of yoga. Mentored by senior figures in the group and getting the Sanskrit symbols for the chakras tattooed on his arm. In 2012, he was often seen at red carpet and social events with his main teacher, Tej Kar Khalsa. He soon became an outspoken advocate for the ecstatic breathing and postural exercises. Uh, I love the ecstatic breathing and some of the, the postural exercises. I, I very quickly stopped doing many of the, the breath and postural exercises because I found, for example, with dog's breath, <laughs> I couldn't do it without tightening my neck. And I couldn't do many of the postures without tightening and constricting my neck. So I simply did not do them. So some of the breath exercises as well, I found that they would cause me to tighten and constrict my neck. So I wouldn't do them. So I became much more selective about what I did there. So I, I steadily, I guess, became out of touch with what was going on there. And I never did get my, my Kundalini yoga name. So here he is in that incarnation in 2018, in a selfie video. Hello, many of you enjoy doing kundalini yoga with an unqualified yoga teacher. That's good. And uh, the chat says, yoga and Talma just like Duvet. Well, you, you should read my depressed blog post from between 2007 and 2013. All right, I sound very much like uh, Duvet. Because that's exactly what I am. This kundalini meditation is fantastic. It says here in my teacher's training manual, that this one is going to make us feel really healthy and like we're smothered in radiant light and beauty. You could just get this. Do you feel smothered in radiant light and beauty when you tune into this show? So how many months of the annual yoga pass went unused after the rabbi's comments? Zero. All right. I used my pass up to the end, but I took the rabbi's remarks into account. I, I wasn't going to, you know, let the, the yoga pass go unused and you know, effectively throw away money. But once you know, I, I continued on for about two or three more months, and, and then I just let it go. So that's the advantage of maintaining a somewhat attenuated relationship with Orthodox Judaism is that people don't make the same demands on you as they would if you had a much closer and more integrated relationship with Orthodox Judaism. So I love Orthodox Jewish community, but I also love my freedom. So I give up some freedom for some community, and I give up some freedom for some community for some freedom. You still have cut me out of the equation. You have to do it for 11 minutes in real Did I ever eat with the Hare Krishnas at their vegan buffets? I would like to say no. I think that would be the correct thing to say. Real life, and you do it while holding your... Well, yes, I, I guess I, I did. Once or twice. I might have. God forbid. Jalanda Banda. Oh, hello. <laughs> so... And I, I said all the chants, you know, Wahe Guru, Wahe Guru, Wahe Guru, Wahe Guru, Wahe Guru, Wahe. Wow, I'm probably spouting idolatry right now. I should probably quit. Pull that in a little bit and have the elbows tucked comfortably against the ribs. Extend the forearms out at a 45 degree angle from the body, thusly, right? And while we're doing it, we chant Rama Dasa Sa Se So Hung. In fact, we don't prolong the hung, we cut it off. Rama Dasa Sa Se. So, I mean, God forbid, at the time, I kind of thought that these Sanskrit prayers were, were more powerful. See, I'm a very religious person. I'm wearing a yarmulke and uh, about a beard. And so, therefore, you know that every word I'm telling you now is absolute divine truth. So you can, you can trust me. I'm, I'm obviously a very strong moral figure. And uh, people 
gather around the world to uh, watch these videos with family and friends and to discuss the profound issues that I raise and to apply some of my teachings to their lives so that they can lead lives of more godliness, holiness, goodness and depth. So I want to talk to you tonight about prayer and which types of prayers are the most powerful. Now I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist so for about 20 years I prayed to Jesus Christ. Frankly it did jack for me. Jack! After 20 years of praying I didn't get nothing of what I most wanted. I didn't get a Dallas Cowboys victory um, after 1978. I was still a virgin, most important of all. Um, I was lonely, I was depressed, I was deformed morally and psychologically, I didn't have enough friends, I was going nowhere with my life. So I switched and I got into Judaism. So for approximately 20 years now I've been saying my prayers in Hebrew as Judaism instructs. Frankly, it's done jack for me. Look at me, I live in a hovel. Look, look at this, I live in a hovel. I wear a, a mouth guard to bed. I, I, look, I have to strap on my, uh, my leg splints at night. Um, this is where I live. Look, look at this. Look at this and weep. Okay, so it's, it's doing jack for me. I ain't married, I ain't got a mortgage, I ain't got a 401k. All I've got is debts and hopelessness. I've had 21 years of illness. I haven't had a healthy day in my life since early February 1988. So the last 21 years of my life I've been sick. So I'm just talking efficacy here. Like, you know, what, what does prayer do for me? Like, what does God do for me? Okay, I mean, you can go to my website, yourmoralleader.com you can see the formidable contributions that I make for God, the Jewish people, and for humanity, and for the doctrines of ethical monotheism. But what's in it for me, okay? I want to know what's in it for me. I, I've always voted Republican, and after eight years of Republican rule, look where I'm living. I'm, I'm willing to give Barack Obama a, a chance, because I ain't going nowhere. Um, I've got chicks who don't call me back. i got no pull with the ladies. I'm a, I'm a mess. So, all the prayers I've been saying in Hebrew ain't done nothing for me. Okay, I still got my chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm still a wreck. So, three weeks ago I started going to yoga where you say prayers in uh, Sanskrit. And they make absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. I mean, Sanskrit terms, uh, Satnam, that's how you greet people. And you start off tooting in, chanting, Om Namo Guru Dev Namo and this refers to the infinite creative energy, reverent greetings implying humility, the giver of the technology divine. This mantra calls upon the creator, establishes a strong and clear connection to the divine teacher with it. Okay, yoga makes no sense to me, these Sanskrit prayers make no sense to me, or the little Hmm, and hmm, and hmm, and hmm, and hmm, and hmm, makes no sense to me. But guess what? What I've been doing ain't been working. So I'm willing to try things that make no sense to me. And why am I willing to try things that make no sense to me? Because tens of thousands of hot chicks in spandex can't be wrong. You go to yoga class, there are three times as many women as guys, and about half the chicks are hot, 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 hot. So. I'm willing to give it a chance. Also, I've got to tell you this, I was in yoga about two weeks ago and sitting next to this beautiful woman who I'd never met before. She was incredibly flexible, she could touch her toes, she could do the splits, she could do things that I can't even describe on this family friendly video channel. And uh, without my saying anything, without her knowing anything about me, she, she intuited and said that I had a very strong sexual energy. Now, I've been praying in churches for 20 years and then praying in synagogues for 20 years. Ain't nobody come up to me and said, I can tell from your prayers that you've got a strong sexual energy. Yeah, and then I, I dated this fine Jewish woman for a year. I mean, yoga is a beautiful thing. So anyway, I'm giving yoga a chance and I've got to tell you, I'm feeling happy. Like, after years of misery, no, I, I didn't own the 19, 
79 Datsun station wagon at this time. In 1995, I bought a Dodge B350 one-ton van. So I was still driving that monstrosity at this time. I'm feeling happy. Like, and it's making me wonder and question, do these Sanskrit prayers, are they more effective? I mean, they make zero sense to me, but somehow when I go... Bro, this is way before my sex addiction. All right, I made this video in late January of 2009. So I didn't start going to sex addiction 12-step meetings until May of 2011. So let's keep our chronology straight, all right? I, I know I'm always into this and I'm into that and I'm all enthused about this solution for my ills and that solution for the world's ills, all right? But this, this is three weeks into my Alexander Technique teacher training uh, two years and four months prior to going to my first 12-step program for sex addiction. Are they doing something? Because something's happening to me, and it ain't from my thrilling Jewish prayer services. There's something new and changed in my life. It's yoga, and it's working, and I'm happy, and I'm aligned. And somehow, I really feel like I'm giving my chronic fatigue syndrome to Wah, wah hey Guru, which is just a Sanskrit uh, Sikh terminology for God. So I'm still... That is my, my shoulders and everything's a lot more compressed, right? I still like much more pulled down and compressed than I am today. Praying to the same God. There's one God who controls the universe who demands moral behavior from us. So that ain't changed. But the way that I'm reaching up to that God is changing a bit in that I'm, I'm trying some of the Sikh stuff and it's working. So why are Sikh prayers more powerful? I mean, your mileage may vary. That's just how it's working for me. I don't understand this. None of this makes any sense to me. You know, I find it, I don't understand. Prayer makes no rational sense to me. Like God's going to change his mind is like, I pray to him every day and say, God, please lessen my chronic fatigue syndrome and he's going to change his mind. Or I say, God, please don't let my mother die of cancer and, oh, he's going to save him from cancer because I prayed for her. Okay, it makes no sense for me. God, please don't let rockets rain down on steroid and kill innocent people. You know, uh, how, how effective were prayers in the Holocaust, okay? I mean, that's the bottom line. My prayers to Hashem through Judaism have been every bit as effective as the prayers of all the Jews who went through Treblinka and uh, Auschwitz through the gas chambers, okay? Didn't do them any good, ain't doing me any good. So I'm trying this Sanskrit stuff, this yoga stuff, this Sikh stuff, makes no sense to me. Stay tuned, I'll let you know how it works. So far, I got it. <laughs> okay, that's from January 2009, God forbid. Hey, so hung, and we pull that hung, we pull that bander right in, hung, we chop it right off, hung, <laughs> like that, with a little bit of leeriness. Before we start, though, you might want to pop a blanket on your head, you might not want to, you might be wearing a Make America Great Again baseball cap, you can put whatever you like on your head, I'm not going to judge you, I don't mind, what do I care, we'll all be dead soon. We start with the old chant, they say this is the tune in frequency, hung, namo, good day, namo, repeat three times. It hasn't changed much, has he? The jokes, the sexual innuendo, the strategic self deprecation. But then also something that the majority of his 6 million plus subscribers on YouTube will have no clue about, which is that he's providing free marketing for an extremely abusive group. If you're not familiar with so the Kundalini my friend Rabbi you can check has just come into the chat room and he accuses me of being filled with goy joy. I don't know, do I seem particularly happy? Maybe it has something to do with this music. It's the music that I listen to in more energetic parts of uh, yoga. Now, my friend Rabbi Gadol says, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! whoa. We, we can't play anything. Uh, can't play anything. Uh, copyright. All right. Let's see. We've got some other videos here on yoga and the Alexander technique. Reading constructive awareness, Alexander technique and the spiritual quest by Daniel McGowan. And uh, on page forty-one, he talks about yoga." And it's so right, because often in yoga, you sit, you're told to sit with your back straight. Most people react to this request by drawing themselves upwards, pushing themselves upward as high as possible. And they try to do something to make the back straight. This doesn't 
last long because our habitual misuse of our body uh, leads to postural reflexes that are not functioning properly. So you cannot escape old ingrained habits of bad use and poor posture simply by will. The old habit is too strong, no amount of doing will achieve a straight back for any length of time or more, more correctly, a balanced, easy posture. So when you're meditating, a balanced, easy posture is highly desirable. You want the body to be comfortable so that the body does not affect the mind. Most people, however, they don't have a back strong enough to support the torso easily, even if they're doing a lot of weight training, etc. They need to be re-educated in constructive awareness to you have to keep a straight back without undue effort. So this is not macho strength developed through brute force. There's a quiet endurance which is gradually built up so the postural reflexes are released and allowed to perform in their proper coordinated function. And this is a great thought. It says that we often think that gravity is a heavy burden that we have to carry. It's the enemy we fight till it lowers, lowers us into the grave. It says it's not true. Only when gravity is restored does the space traveler return to an erect position, an erect posture. So if you remove gravity, such as with astronauts in space, then contrary to expectation, the body does not lengthen and expand. It shortens and narrows. Gravity actually allows the body to expand in all directions. So people often think that we will inevitably must become stooped and bent in old age. This is unnecessary if you learn good use and good ways to think about how you use yourself and constructive awareness. You can have good use as you get older and older. Okay, not exactly a particularly uh, dynamic dynamic video there. I apologize. I call the New York Times Sunday Magazine on the risks and the rewards of yoga. We hear a lot about the rewards of yoga, but we don't hear so much in the news media about the risks of yoga. And yet, yoga is probably the biggest source of uh, injuries for, for for many people, the uh, you know, biggest source of income for physical therapists. So, New York Times reports Indian practitioners of yoga typically squatted and sat cross-legged in daily life. And yoga poses, or what are called asanas, were an outgrowth of these postures. Now people in the Western world they tend to sit in chairs all day, and they work into a yoga studio a couple of times a week and stretch and strain <laughs> to twist themselves to ever more difficult postures, despite their lack of flexibility and other physical problems. And uh, supposedly, wow! I just don't have the energy and the charisma. This is from 2012, when it, when I didn't have the the beard anymore. Okay, Alexander technique and yoga. Maybe if I play. I like to be helpful and kind. I like to do just random acts of kindness as many times a day as I can. So when I was checking myself into yoga the other day, I I just took out my my key keychain and just ran up past the scanner to help the woman behind the, the, the desk. And she responded, you just checked yourself into the pregnancy class. That's okay, I responded. Half of them are mine anyway. And the other girl behind the desk said, just what we need, off-color humor at yoga. So a lot of people ask me how I can reconcile my yoga with my Orthodox Judaism. I don't is my favorite response.